I am back this quick. We are on week 30. This week's travels were 2 Kings 8 through 12, 2 Chronicles 21 through 24, all of Joel, which is chapters 1 through 3. We did Psalms 49, Psalms 50, Psalms 131, and then we did Matthew 6 through 10. So, how it works, I give you some pointers from my study, tell you how I see me, ask how we see you, and then we go from there. So let's get started. 2 Kings, starting with chapter 8, we get the Shunammite woman's land restored. Elisha had come to the Shunammite woman, remember her with the hospitality the kid, the son that died, the son that got restored. Well, he was letting her know that there was about to be a famine in the land for seven years, so he told her just go somewhere and stay there. And then after the famine was over, she could come back. And she did. She came back, talked to the king. The king restored all of her land and all that stuff. We get Aram's uh, king, Haziel. And um, this was about Elisha uh, prophesying about the king recovering. But then he would die. He would eventually die. And so what happened was the king had sent Haziel to talk to Elisha like, hey, I got this sickness. Am I going to die of it? And Elisha told him, he said, you know, you're going to recover, but you'll eventually die. And then Elisha started crying. And then Haziel was like, why are you crying? What's happening? And he said, because I know that eventually you're going to be the king and you're going to be horrendous. She's going to be terrible to the children of Israel. And so, of course, King the um, Haziel comes back, kills the king, and then, of course, he does everything Elisha says. And so Judah's king was Jehoram. Jehoram, of course, he did evil. And then he had King Ahiza. After that, he did evil. Uh, and then Jehu gets anointed as Israel's king. Elisha basically gave them a plan of what to do in order to secretly anoint Jehu as the king. And so Jehu ends up having to kill Joram and Ahiza and Jezebel. All of these people, they were all evil. And Joram, who's doing right, ends up uh, going to war against them and killing them. And then Jehu ends up going into the house of Ahab, killed all the 70 sons, ends up dying. And then Jehu goes into um, calls. He tricks all the Baal worshipers and prophets and all of them. Tells them all come down to the where to the temple where they worship Baal. And then he had all of them killed. And so, based on how well Jehu handled his reign, God told him that for four gener his four of his generations would sit on the throne. And then chapter eleven was about Athila ends up usurping the throne, okay? She kills all the heirs so that she would end up being the queen, okay? She kills all the heirs who would have been king, except there was one um, who ends up getting hidden by the aunt. Her, it was, it was the, his name was um, Joash. He was young. They hid him. He was like a baby. They hid him for six years. Her husband was a priest. Um, so they hid him for six years. And so um, that's how you thought Athila ends up getting the throne. And she thought she had killed all the sons, but she didn't know one was hidden. And so six years later, when he was seven, after they had hit him for six years, they end up taking him back and saying he's the rightful person for the throne. So they overthrow her. And if she had the audacity to holler treason, this is the woman who killed people. So, so funny how people do things. So Joash becomes king. He's age seven. And he has Jehida, who is the priest, his uncle, is kind of like mentoring him. And so as, as the whole time that Jehida was alive, Joash did really good. Okay. So as the king of Judah, he repaired the temple. I mean, he did all kind of good things. And then um, Jehida died, and then Joash wasn't the best, okay? Our, the Armenian army came to invade Judah, and then Joash actually took items from the temple in order to bribe the king 
okay, the king of Aram. And so uh, Joash ends up being assassinated. His servants conspired together and they killed him. And so that's what happened in chapter 12. And so I said, Father, remind me that my devotion to you must begin and end from an inner place with uh, my fruit showing outwardly. So it begins on the inside and then you show fruit, fruit outwardly. My question was, has God ever fulfilled a promise to you even when you did not 100% obey him? I've been in that place. I imagine many of you have too, whether you want to admit it or not. And so then we get to 2 Chronicles 21 through 24. And it remembers 2 Chronicles just basically gives you a more detailed story of what they talk about in Kings. Because you when you're reading Kings, like at the end of some chapters, they'll say, and all of the rest of the story is written in the, in the Chronicles or the Annal of blah, blah, blah. That's what they kind of say. So 2 Chronicles kind of gives you this. But remember, it's mostly about Judah. And it gives you more details about Judah. Doesn't really function, uh, focus a lot on uh, Israel and all the kings that they had. And so chapter 21, we talk about Jehoram becomes king over Judah. And then Judah, um, um, Elijah's letter that goes to Jehoram. And then Jehoram's last days. Chapter 22, we talk about Judah's king Ahiza. Then we talk about Athila, who usurps the throne, the murderous one. Then chapter three, 23, we talk about how Athila gets overthrown and Joash becomes king and Jehoda, Jehida, who's the priest, how he reforms things. And then chapter 24, it gives you a lot about Judas King Joash repairing the temple and then Joash apostasy. That means he turned his back on his, his religion. And then the Aramaeans invasion of Judah and then how Joash gets assassinated. So, that's what you get from that. And then we read Joel, which is the whole book, chapter one through three. And so Joel, this book, um, the concern was with motivating repentance by re proclaiming the coming day of the Lord. Joel speaks of God's people being in desperate need of repentance in order to experience restoration. So you have to repent, then restoration comes. It talks about the day of the Lord, which is basically a time of judgment that precedes restoration, a time when God recalibrates to make things right what was wrong. OK, so a lot of times you hear about the day of the Lord, day of the Lord is not necessarily the end time when Jesus breaks the sky. It's just talking about this particular time when God is going to give judgment. OK, because he's trying to restore, but he has to give judgment and then he restores by recalibrating all the mess that we have made. The word of the Lord came to Joel, which means Joel didn't seek this message. He was called by God. So chapter one talks about a plague of locusts in the day of the Lord. Chapter two talks about the day of the Lord, God's call for repentance, God's response to his people and God's promise of his spirit. Now in Acts where Peter gets up and preaches during the Pentecost, he's quoting Joel chapter two, 28 through 32. Okay, so you can find like Peter preaches it, but he basically is pulling from the Old Testament and the prophet Joel. Chapter three is about judgment of the nations and Israel being blessed. I said, Lord, remind me that to repent is to change my mind and reverse my direction. Okay, repenting isn't just changing my mind and being sorry. It's to reverse the direction and going opposite of whatever direction I'm going in. My question for you, when was the last time you experienced a spiritual turnaround? And I define that as an outward manifestation of actions that matches an inward attitude. So I have this belief and feeling on the inside and then I manifest it, manifest it by the actions that come on the outside. And then Psalms 49 and 50 um, we have misplaced trust in wealth. They trust in their wealth and they boast of their abundant riches. Yet these cannot redeem a person or pay his ransom to God since the price of redemption is too costly. And then we get Psalms 50 and it's entitled God as judge. And from that I wrote, God call on me in the day. No, let me start all over. Chapter 50 is about God as judge. What I wrote, the lines that I like from this 
was God. I keep saying God because I keep saying it in the title. What I really wrote, it started with call on me in the day of trouble and I will rescue you and you will honor me. Understand this. You who forget God will be torn apart and there will be no one to rescue you. Ooh, that took a lot, didn't it? Okay. And then we get to Psalms 131. Okay. And it is uh, a song of ascent. It's like having a childlike trust in the Lord. Oh Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul. Like a winged child rests against his mother, my soul is like a winged child within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. So I just kind of gave you all of that, okay? And then we get to Matthew 6 through 10, okay? And we have chapter 6 is about more discourses. It's on how to give, how to pray, how to fast. Chapter 6 is also where we find Jesus teaching them the Lord's Prayer. That's in verse 9 through 13. We also talk about God and possessions, okay? That's when we talk about how you can't serve two masters. God talks about you can't serve God and money. And then we get the cure for anxiety. And God talks about why worry? The birds aren't worrying. The flowers don't worry. How they're going to get dressed, they just turn out pretty. Okay, the birds aren't worrying about, oh my gosh, where am I getting my next meal? They just flying about, they eat. Okay, chapter seven, he talks about not judging. He talks about asking, searching, and knocking. That's about prayer. He talks about entering the kingdom. That's about the false prophets. He talks about the two foundations when you build a house on a rock versus sand. Chapter eight, we get uh, the story of the man who was cleansed. We talk about the centurion's faith. We get a healing at Capernaum. We get the cost of following Jesus, okay? And then they end up on a boat and we get how the winds and the waves obey Jesus. And then he tells the story of how the demons get driven out by Jesus. Chapter nine, we talk about the son of man, that's Jesus, forgiving and healing. The call of Matthew, there's a question about fasting, he explains. A girl gets restored. The woman with the issue of blood gets healed. We talk about the healing of the blind, driving out demons, and the Lord of the harvest. And then chapter 10 is the commissioning of the 12. The 12 disciples being Simon Peter, that's one, his brother Andrew, James and John, those are the sons of Zebedee, sons of Thunder, Thunder. you get Philip and Bartholomew, you get Thomas, Matthew, Matthew was a tax collector, we get James, Thaddeus, we get Simon the Zealot, and then finally we get Judas Iscariot, okay? In this chapter, they talk about the persecutions that Jesus is telling them about. He's predicting the persecutions that are going to come. He talks about fearing God. He talks about acknowledging Christ. And then he talks about a cup of cold water. That's a good story. You should read that in chapter 10. And so for me, I said, Lord, remind me that the three answers to your, when I pray, you're either telling me, yes, Jacqueline, you're saying, no, Jacqueline, or you're saying, wait, Jacqueline. It's one or the other. And my question for you is, do you fear those who have temporary power in history or the one who has limitless power in eternity? That's the question. And so those are our travels for this week. Next week, we're going to um, finish. We're going to go through 2 Kings chapters 13 and 14. We're going to do 2 Chronicles chapter 25. We're going to do all of Jonah. I think there's three chapters in Jonah. We're going to do Amos 1 through 9. We're going to do Psalms 53 and 55. And then we're going to do Matthew 11 through 15. And so those are our travels for next week. Thanks so much for traveling with me this week. I enjoyed you.